So Hazel, tell us about this um, this um, research you've got, this psychogeology or whatever it is. <laughs> well, I don't think that um, psychogeology is necessarily the way that we would talk about it. Um, we really prefer to call it something called geoscience cognition, which is um, an investigation into how people think about and understand the world beneath our feet, that geological subsurface. And it really involves a melding of two different subjects, um, the subject of geology, obviously, and the subject of cognition, which is a psychology subject. And the mental models technique is really useful because it allows us to really explore in depth how people think about a certain subject. And one of the other really good values that the mental models technique has is that it doesn't place the expert in a position of superiority to the non-expert. This is um, something that's quite commonly done where people will say, well, we have to see what the expert knows and then bring the public up to the expert. So they're both legitimate, are they? Exactly. They have different types of knowledge, but they're both valued equally. And this is what's really, I think, really important about the mental models technique and what's been really helpful in my studies is helping to see both perspectives equally. And this is um, really important when it comes to looking at geoscience communication, which is another related topic, um, because understanding how people think about things can improve the way that we communicate with them about new, controversial or contested subjects. If we want to communicate effectively with people about geoscience topics, then we need to um, be able to know what they understand and how they think about things in order to make the best connection with them. So we use psychological techniques um, that are usually used in um, cognitive studies to try and find out how people think about the geological subsurface. So we do a lot of interviews and questionnaires and use things like um, models, like this um, cube model that I've got here, mm. which is a model that we used during my recent research to try and find out what people thought existed underneath their feet by making a, a kind of a representation of the surface or then aerial photo on the top mm -hmm. um, and then by putting whiteboard on the side and asking people to demonstrate to us what they thought existed underneath their feet. The cube model was really useful because geology is quite a visual science and actually trying to describe some of the things that you think about geology when you're not a geologist can be really difficult and so having something like this um, block model was really useful in allowing people to kind of draw or use stickers to represent what they thought existed in the geological subsurface. So what were some of the findings from the study then? Well, um, what was really interesting is that we found that the, the different groups really approached the idea of what existed in the geological subsurface very differently. So the um, geoscience experts were quite happy with uh, using a, a landscape cue, mm. um, such as a geological feature, or a cliff, or something like that, to use that as a, an indicator to penetrate through that kind of surface, subsurface boundary to give them an idea of what existed in the subsurface. Whereas the non-experts used quite often a very different technique. They would use a human or anthropocentric idea, so a mine, for example, to penetrate through that boundary. And it was that human interaction that took them below the subsurface. So does that mean that geologists kind of think about the natural world fundamentally different from normal people? <laughs> I think in a way, yes, because our training takes us to a place where we're using the way that we conceptualise geology and the geosciences to a completely different place to a non-expert. And quite often that training is so embedded in our thinking that we don't remember that we used to think about this differently. And for instance, one of the ways that this happens is that geoscientists are really comfortable using a technique called three-dimensional spatial reasoning, which is where you um, are happy conceptualising things in 3D and rotating them and moving them around. And this is something that geologists do almost unconsciously, I would say. But it's very different to the way that a non-expert will think about things. In fact, with my study, what I found is that it's very uncommon for um, the non-expert participants to use three-dimensional spatial reasoning when talking about the geological subsurface. When they did use it, it was much more geographical, so they were thinking about the location of certain things in their landscape, but it never penetrated below the surface. And so I think that can be a challenge to try and remember the way, that the fundamental way that we think about geology is different to someone who hasn't had advanced geological training. So how did you end up doing this? What's your <laughs> background? Uh, well, I started out um, 
as a geologist, I did my undergraduate here at Plymouth um, in uh, physical geography and geology. And um, I was, you know, I've loved geology ever since I was a little kid, basically. But um, I really wanted to pursue it as a career. So I went to Portsmouth afterwards and did a master's and then got a job um, doing uh, geotechnical engineering in Australia. It was my first job. So I worked for a year or so in industry. And that was a really exciting experience for me because I got to really see what it's like to be a commercial geologist, so we say, someone who's making money from their geological knowledge. But it wasn't quite the best fit for me, so I decided to change directions on my career and ended up at Mount St. Helens in America for a season um, working as a ranger. And um, it was a brilliant experience because not only was I doing science, but I was also doing science communication, which is something that I hadn't kind of done before. And basically, at the end of my time at Mount St. Helens, I came back to the UK and I knew that was what I wanted to do. So I got a job at the Natural History Museum working in science communication for um, about four or five years. And then eventually, I decided to try and find out how communication about geology can be improved because there's a lot of things you see when you're communicating directly with the public that you think this isn't working I'm telling someone about my knowledge and my passion but it's not connecting with them it's not connecting with their knowledge and their passion why not where's the gap and so that was something that I was really interested in and so contacted you and spoke about it a bit and then eventually ended up with a PhD which thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> but you I mean Clearly, you think geoscience communication is going to be big, a big area. I do. I think that it's crucial um, for our future because I think, as a society, we're facing a lot of really big questions about our energy usage, both past, present, and future, and that geology has a lot of the answers to these questions. Sometimes they're uncomfortable answers, but they're answers that provoke discussion. And if we're not able to have a discussion about these big questions, then we're really crippling ourselves before we've even made our path into the future. So I think that geoscience communication, as a part of science communication in general, is really important to our society's development here in the UK.